We are in Te Anu, New Zealand today, getting ready to start the Milford Track, one of the great walks of New Zealand. And we're actually getting ready to jump on a shuttle bus that takes us to a water taxi to begin the start of the trek. Because the track is isolated out in the middle of fjordlands, there's the only way to get to it is by water taxi. And because of that fact, it increases the cost of this trek. It's about $200 per person for both the drop-off and the pickup at the end of the track. So that makes this one of the more expensive great walks here in New Zealand. Although because it is off season right now, the hut prices are reduced. Peak season, those huts book out on the first day they open up for availability. So we feel really lucky to be doing it in the off season and to still have transportation available. So this over 50 kilometer walk is the most remote walk in all of New Zealand. If something goes wrong, there's no way to hike out, obviously, because the boat drops you off, the boat picks you up further down the track. That's why they require you to have a personal locator beacon. If you don't have one, you can rent one from the dock for $40 a week, but that's just an additional cost for this epic trek and the boat ride in, stunning scenery all the way up into this fjord and now set off on the on the four day three night adventure some people do it in three days and two nights this first day to the first hut it's only about an hour and a half So over the next four days, we'll be going through rainforest. We'll be going along massive glacial formed uh, valleys and cliffs across a pass. There's going to be tremendous waterfalls. It is going to be a truly epic adventure out here on the Milford track. The track has been referred to as the finest walk in the world. So we're going to see if that's true, but already the boat ride in, I think is worth the 200 bucks. Just take my money. That boat ride was awesome. Not exactly what this first structure we've come across is. It says Glade House. I guess it's like a private residence or a private cabin or something. It's not a dock hut. Still another hour to go to the first hut. But I believe they have a toilet here in case somebody has to use it. So I believe this is part of the luxury tramping packages that you can get guided tours, two or three thousand bucks. You get nice luxury accommodations here. They are closed for the season though. They only offer those during peak tourist season. So if you're feeling like you need a guide or you need to be pampered and not just a dock hut and you need some luxury accommodations, they got you covered on the Milford track. So last winter, there were massive floods in Milford Sound. So much so that it took out the, the Milford Sound Road and there was a big effort to rebuild that in time for the summer season. There was also massive flows that damaged this track substantially. Lots of down trees and lots of the track simply washed away by these rivers. One of the dangerous things about this track is in inclement weather, 
these rivers can be particularly hazardous and that is the number one cause of people who have died on this track is just getting swept away by a swelling river and they're a little too close to the edge or they're trying a, a, a stream crossing or something like that and again because it is so remote rescue is a lot tougher to come by Behind me you can see this wetland area, this boggy area, and this material here is known as peat, and sometimes they can be as deep as 5 meters, 15 feet deep. This peat acts as a giant sponge, and it's one of the reasons why wetland areas like this are super important to the surrounding ecosystem. Because what happens in wet periods, this bog absorbs water, and then in dry periods, it slowly releases that water to feed the surrounding areas. And that's why wetlands are critically important. So when you hear people talk about, you know, not developing wetlands, not polluting wetlands, stuff like this that looks like, oh, there's not much trees there, there's not much going on there, we could just fill that in with cement and build houses and condos and all that sort of thing. When you do that, it affects not just this direct area and the insects and birds and wildlife that live here, but it affects all the other wildlife that lives in the surrounding ecosystem in these bigger trees and further downstream. Well, we made it to the first hut. Nice, leisurely first day here. Beautiful views of the mountains in the background there. And I will say one thing about the Milford track that a lot of people bring up is the sand flies. The sand flies are bad. And that is the case. They, they are bad, but only if you stop. Like right now, I think they found me. They're, they're crawling on my camera, they're crawling on me. But if you keep moving, if you move just a little bit, if you keep it moving, the sand flies will not find you. Good to wear long sleeves and long pants though because they tend to go for like your elbows, wrists, and uh, an ankle area. Beautiful day. Tomorrow we're going to get into it. I think it's only 250 to 300 meter elevation gain tomorrow and then the third day is the biggest. That's when we go over the pass. That's a 500 meter elevation gain. But uh, beautiful start to the Milford Trek. Getting ready to roll out here on the Milford track and it's a, a little bit of an overcast, misty morning here. Rolling out right around first light this morning and uh, got another, I don't know, half hour or so until sunrise. But there's a real important reason that we are um, leaving real early today. It's supposed to be about a six hour day. First kind of elevation gain yesterday was really flat but the main reason we're doing this is because the huts only have 40 beds however the the boat companies the transport companies are allowed to drop off a maximum of 48 people so that means if they're filled to capacity there's eight people that are going to be sleeping on the floor of the hut they're not going to have a bed in the hut so we're trying to leave early to make sure in case a group left is leaving today and they're going to skip this hut and just do this second hut that we're going to hit as their first hut we don't want to be stuck without a bed so we're leaving early and that's the difference when doing it off season is you're not guaranteed a bed when you do it during peak summer season uh, you book it online so it's it's the exact amount um, of beds in the hut that's the number of people that they book out so a bit of a misty morning hopefully it clears up I kind of like the mist actually. It's like a ominous little magical flare to the morning. So 
So another issue that you have to consider when doing this in the off season is that DOC, the Department of Conservation, will remove the bridges at most of the stream crossings for the winter season. That's to prevent them from getting damaged in a potential avalanche situation. So this year, I don't know if it's the same date every year, but after June 5th, all those bridges will be taken out. So you kind of have this window of mainly the month of May where peak season ends at the end of April and then you have a month until, a little bit more than a month, until they remove those stream crossing bridges June 5th, which is the Queen's birthday. I didn't know New Zealand had a Queen, but I think her name is Jacinda Ardern. So that's something, something else to keep in mind is that if you do this later in the season, which you may not even be able to get transport. We were lucky enough to uh, meet a couple people on the Mueller hut and arrange to get transport with them because the transport companies will only do a minimum of a certain number of people. Some of them they'll only take a minimum of six, a minimum of four. So if it's just you or you and one other person, you may not have enough people to get the transport company to take you. So there's kind of a lot of factors involved when doing it in off season, but right now is, is the perfect time to do it. If you can catch a nice weather window like we have found, should be beautiful weather for the next couple days. A little misty this morning, but I think it's gonna burn off. But if you can get that weather window in May before they take the bridges out, that is the time to go. So as we're gaining elevation here, the trees are getting bigger and bigger and more impressive. The mist is still there, but I think it's almost about to burn off. Unless it's gonna start raining, I don't know. It does rain over 200 days a year here in Fjordland National Park. So to have this block of three or four days of good weather where it's not raining is truly spectacular. We're super lucky to be able to experience this. So just passed a sign that said the first view of McKinnon Pass is right ahead. McKinnon Pass is what we'll be going over tomorrow. Tomorrow's the highest uh, elevation gain that we'll be getting about 500 meters, but first glimpse of what we'll be doing tomorrow. So it's almost one o'clock in the afternoon and the sun finally has come over the ridge and uh, burned off that mist. So made it through that valley there and I think we got maybe an hour or so, maybe a little more than an hour to the next hut. But finally, 
finally getting some sunny clear blue skies and that sun feels really good because that valley was cold. So now it appears that the bulk of the remaining elevation gain is going to be in this last hour and a half to two hours because it's really the first time where we're starting to go starting to go up. So maybe two hours, hour and a half, something like that left. I'm glad to be in the sun, shedding some layers and uh, enjoying the warmth now after getting out of that cold valley. Well, made it to the brand new Mintaro hut. It's about 15 minutes past the old one, which was taken out in the floods last year. So we were a little worried because we got to the point where on the topo map, the hut is supposed to be, and there was just a kind of like a tape saying, oh, this structure is closed. But then we recalled our conversation with the boat driver who said that the original one had got taken out in the flood. And then so there was a brand new hut they just built this year and it's super nice inside super clean epic views and I believe this is what we're going over tomorrow McKinnon Pass it's gonna be the longest day or I should say it's gonna be the hardest day it's still only supposed to be about six hours today it took us a little over seven hours seven hours and ten minutes but uh, most elevation gain is tomorrow got a nice little fire going although there's not much firewood here I think this is next season's firewood here, but it's all wet. <laughs> so the little scraps we can find we got going now and the cook some dinner, probably going to be an early night. It is a misty fjordland morning once again and McKinnon Pass is looking a little fogged in. So we're going a little bit later today, so hopefully it clears up by the time we get up to the top. Two hours to the top of McKinnon Pass, supposedly a six hour day, but Again, we're taking it pretty slow, so we'll see how long that takes. Again, this new hut, super beautiful in this little valley with tremendous cliffs on either side. The one thing I would say is the people who do this next year will be able to enjoy the dried firewood better because all the firewood here last night was still pretty wet. It's gonna be a tough day. Most elevation gain, 500 meters up to the pass and then pretty much down the rest of the day. is flying overhead. The world's only alpine parrot is found here in New Zealand and there's like two or three of them flying over my head right now. It is impossible to capture the scale and magnitude of Fjordland especially where we are without some kind of drone shot or aerial shot. It is just magnificent, awe-inspiring, massive cliffs and these glacially formed valleys that we're hiking through. And I really hope I'm bringing some of that to you guys and hopefully can show you more of that scale once we get up to the ridge line. Maybe capture some of these Kias for you as well. Maybe, I should say, document some of these Kias. I'm not gonna try to put one in a cage or anything like that. <laughs>
headed to McKinnon Pass in, in just about two hours. Unfortunately, it hasn't really cleared up. There was a group up here waiting for about half an hour for it to clear up and it just comes and goes like the fog is just rolling in every once in a while. Catch a clear glimpse of that valley. McKinnon Pass Shelter is about a half hour away. And then about another four hours, three and a half, four hours to where we're gonna spend the night. Still pretty epic views. Oh, look at that. That is epic right now as the clouds part. So I had no idea about this Moraine Creek, beautiful blue glacier waterfall after waterfall. We made our way down from the pass. We had to take the emergency route because the other main route was closed for the season. And then we were greeted by this amazing creek fed by glacier snowmelt and just stunning blue waterfall after blue waterfall. That was a, a pleasant surprise for me. So it's the last day here on the Milford track. Had a great night of sleep at the Dumpling Hut. They got a great wood burning stove here and like metal on the back to reflect the heat back to you. In fact, a bunch of people ended up just sleeping up in the kitchen, dragging their mattresses up and sleeping in the kitchen, which is something you can do in the off season, not during peak season when everyone's inside a bunk and you have a hut warden watching over you. So is this the finest walk in the world? I'm still not convinced. Hopefully the last day will convince me whether this is the finest walk in the world or not. Looking forward to some, some more epic waterfalls and a nice leisurely stroll out through this amazing rainforest. So this is the second recently downed tree, maybe toppled in some wind that we had the other day. The second one that we've had to cross, it looks like it just happened yesterday or the day before, but we did have those high winds on the pass, so you go over or take your bag off and go under, it looks like. The one thing I will say is the sand flies so far at the end of May here on the Milford track have been practically non-existent. Haven't seen any since the first day. So seems like the colder weather is a good time to do this track so you don't have to deal with those pests because I've heard in the summer they can be pretty bad.
infamous.